Consider the limit, the limit, as x approaches 0 of x squared times cosine of x. We can say, well, this is just going to be the limit of x squared times the limit of cosine of x as x goes to 0. And, and we know what those are. Your x is going to go to 0, so x squared is also going to 0. And cosine of x, as my x goes to 0, cosine is at 1, and so it's going to be 0 times 1, and so this will give you an overall limit of 0. Fine. But what if we were just to slightly change the problem to make it the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared times cosine of 1 over x? See, you're tempted to do the same kind of argument and say, well, it's just going to be the limit of the x squared times whatever the limit of cosine of 1 over x is. But here's the problem. Although you know this first term is 0, the second term, what is cosine of 1 over x? Well, remember, 1 over x is not well defined. The limit does not exist. This limit here, this particular piece, does not exist. Because the 1 over x is going one way, the one direction, the other way, the other direction. So, so that's not going to work, and this is going to become a bigger mess when you put it into cosine. So, so we can't even begin to make sense of this limit. And so, therefore, you can't say this is the first one times the second one, because you can only break it up into its pieces when each of its pieces has a well-defined limit. And so, so this method fails us. So we need some other way to analyze this problem. And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to say, yeah, 1 over x is a really poorly behaved thing, especially by 0. You get this vertical asymptote there. But you know what? Since we're plugging that into cosine, it doesn't really matter. Because we know that no matter what you plug into cosine, cosine is always going to spit out a value. You always get out something that is between minus 1 and 1. Cosine of anything, or cosine just moves from minus 1 to 1. And so, therefore, when you multiply by x squared, your x squared times your cosine of 1 over x will have to give out some value that's between minus x squared and x squared. x squared is some positive number, so you can just multiply through your inequalities by it, and, and you get something between minus x squared and positive x squared. Well, let's go ahead and graph that and see what that looks like. Here I'm going to draw a little graph. And, and we can come onto this graph, and we can graph the x squared. And so x squared just looks like this. Up top, you have y equals x squared. And, and on bottom, the minus x squared would just be pointing down the, the, the opposite direction. So it would look something, oop, something like, something like this. y equals minus x squared. So, so then the function we're really interested in, this cosine of 1 over x times x squared function, we know that thing is bounded between these two. It, it lives somewhere in between the, the x squared and the minus x squared. So, so what, is, what does that function do? Well, I don't know, but it's stuck between these. It, it's, it's probably going to be going back and forth, doing all kinds of crazy things, but it's stuck between them. It can't go above x squared, and it can't go below minus x squared. But notice, what happens then as you come to 0? Well, this top function, this top x squared, is coming down to 0. And this bottom function, this minus x squared, is coming up to 0. And since our function is trapped between them, it also must go to 0. That is, this limit must be equal to 0 because both of these are going to 0. Both the limit of minus x squared is going to 0 and the limit of x squared is going to 0 as your x goes to 0. In general, we call this the squeeze theorem. If you have some function 
that is squeezed between two other functions. If your f of x is squeezed between some g of x and some h of x, that is, it's always bigger than the g of x and always smaller than the h of x. And if those two outside functions both go to the same thing, if the limit of the g of x is equal to the same limit as the limit of the h of x, as your x goes to some constant c, then because your f is trapped in the middle and they're both going to, to the same value l, l, the, the function um, f must also have limit l. Its limit must also be equal to l. Your function is trapped between two other functions and both of those functions have zero as its limit Therefore, it must also have zero as its limit. Of course, the squeeze theorem doesn't only apply when it's going to zero, it's for any C. You could even do it infinite limits. Consider the limit as X goes off to infinity of cosine of the square root of X plus one divided by X. Here, x is going off to infinity. What will this limit be equal to? Well, reason just like before. We know that cosine of whatever you put into it is going to spit out values between minus 1 and 1. So cosine of the square root of x plus 1 must be spitting out values that are between minus 1 and 1. Therefore, cosine divided by x must be spitting out values that are somewhere in between minus 1 over x and 1 over x. If you were to draw a graph of this, we can do that. Here's our graph. What does 1 over x look like? 1 over x is shrinking and close and close to 0. Minus 1 over x is coming up, getting closer and closer and closer to 0. And so here your, your cosine of the square root of x plus one divided by x is trapped between those. Who knows what it's doing, but it's trapped between those. But notice the limit of this lower limit, the limit of this lower bound, the limit of minus one over x as x goes to infinity. Well, that's getting closer and closer to zero, we said. And so is the limit of the upper bound, the limit of one over x as x goes off to infinity is going off to zero. Therefore, by the squeeze theorem, the overall limit will also be equal to zero.